Well, dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace. Amen. We're on week 14 of the story, working our way through the Bible. Our theme today is a kingdom torn in two. And before we get into the story of Jeroboam and Rehoboam and the northern and southern kingdoms, let's pause for a moment and kind of remember how we got where we are. Kind of pause for a moment for the historical context in which we find ourselves as we're moving from the beginning of the Bible to the end on May 17th. We began in Genesis, remember, in the story of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, Cain and Abel, Noah and the Flood in Genesis 6 through 9 in the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. In Genesis 12, remember, we talked about Abraham and how God got specific to the call of Abraham, telling him that he would bless he and Sarah with a child, who had Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Esau. Remember the birth of the 12 sons of Jacob? Jacob was the one whose name was changed to Israel. So Jacob's 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel, which will be important to remember a little later in this <coughs> sermon. Each one of those 12 sons developed a tribe of their own, which, when they got to the Promised Land, <clears throat> they each had their own piece of land in the Promised Land where their family and their tribe lived. From Genesis, we went to the book of Exodus with the captivity of the people of Israel in Egypt, and Moses and Aaron remember going back and forth to the Pharaoh saying, let my people go, until all of the plagues happened, and with the plague of the killing of the firstborn son, um, the people of Israel escaped by putting the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, remember when the angel of death passed over them. They went through the Red Sea on the way to the Promised Land, but remember how on the way, easy way to the Promised Land, they sinned against God by not believing God, and so God gave them 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. It was during the time of wandering in the wilderness that they got the Ten Commandments, the water from the rock, the manna, which were all the way that God provided for people during the wilderness wanderers. So we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses dies at the end of Deuteronomy and passes the leadership book, leadership torch, to Joshua, the sixth book of the Bible. Joshua was one who fit the Battle of Jericho and finally brought the people in to the Promised Land. So here's the 12 tribes in the Promised Land. Life should have been good. Everything that they had been looking for was finally realized as they had their land in the Promised Land. But they got squabbling among one another, and so God appointed judges to judge between them. Judges is the seventh book of the Bible. If you remember that during the time of the judges, there was this cycle of rebellion, repentance, and renewal. Then they get a new judge. There would be rebellion, repentance, renewal. That cycle during the period of judges happened seven times during those 320 years. And finally, it was not uh, to be done an eighth time and they started um, appointing prophets. Life should have been good for them. They had everything going for them, but they rebelled against God. So after the period of the judges, they wanted a king. So we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, bringing him into the Promised Land, Judges, small intervention with Ruth, and then 1st and 2nd Samuel, the prophets, and first and second kings, that's where we find ourselves today. Samuel was the kind of time of David. The kings is where we find ourselves today. Israel had begged for a king to lead them because they believed that a king would unite the 12 tribes of Israel into one strong nation. They looked around them and all of the pagan people around them had kings. So they figured, well, we should have a king. God had been their king up until this point, but that wasn't enough for them. We want to be like the Joneses and keep up to them. And so let's have a king centered around a royal line. 
Remember, Saul was the first king who wasn't pleasing to God. King David was the second king who had a lot of struggles, but at the end kept his heart toward God. And Solomon was the third king that we talked about last week. Solomon, the son of David and Bathsheba. Solomon, the richest and wisest person in all of history. But he also had his troubles when he started letting all of his money and his lust for women get the best of him. So after the death of Solomon, there begins a family feud with who will be the next king. Let me read our first lesson again for today. After the Lord, and, and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your mind and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded you, God says, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David your father, I will not do it in your days, but I'll tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So that's the context in which we find ourselves. And from now on, through much of the rest of the Old Testament, as a consequence of Solomon's sin, God permitted adversaries to threaten Israel, and the golden era of prosperity and power and prestige over which Solomon once ruled begins to crash down around them. During the time of Solomon, there were incredible riches which Solomon had accumulated, but while he was rich in many things, he was living in spiritual poverty. Spiritual poverty. As the Bible says, the love of money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money itself. It does not say it's bad to have money, but the love of money. When you elevate money, cars, houses, whatever it is, when you elevate that above God, and that becomes the focus of your life, that's the root of all evil, the Bible says. Not money, not cars, not houses, but the love of them, elevating the love of them above all else. And when we allow something else to come in between our relationship with the living and loving God, then that becomes a barrier, it becomes an idol that separates us from God. For Solomon, like we talked about last week, it wasn't only his money, his love of money, but his love of women. 700 wives and 300 concubines who led his heart away from God. And as it always happens, with the king, with the president, with the head of a household, when the leader goes bad, oftentimes those around him or her go bad. Remember in the Old Testament, we've talked so many times about doing what's right in the eyes of God and in our eyes. Doing right in our eyes is often antithetical or opposite to what's good in the eyes of God's upper plan story for us. When we do things that are good in our eyes, as people throughout the Old Testament did, then we deviate, we separate, we detour from God's upper plan story for ourselves. When we do what's good in our eyes and not what good's in God's eyes, then the results are often disastrous. Well, as King Solomon was dying, there was a ruler over the people of Israel, they were a united kingdom now, whose name was Jeroboam, J. Jeroboam was a man of standing, he was one of Solomon's officials, a part of the cabinet, and Solomon respected Jeroboam so much that he put him in charge of the entire labor force of the nation of Israel. One day, Jeroboam, a good guy at this point, was approached by a prophet who took off his brand new robe, tore it into 12 pieces, and the prophet told Jeroboam, take 10 pieces of my robe, and this represents your leadership over 10 
tribes of Israel. He told Jeroboam <coughs> that he would be a great God, as long, a great king, as long as he obeyed God's command. Well, as it happened, Solomon was not dead yet. He heard someone tell him that this prophet had done that to Jeroboam. So Solomon immediately put a bounty on Jeroboam's life, and Jeroboam fled down to Egypt. Now, while Jeroboam was gone in Egypt, Solomon died, and before Solomon died, he declared that his son, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, I know they sound similar, <laughs> Johnson and Peterson, but Rehoboam was Solomon's son, and he declared that he would be king over Israel. So we hear and we have pretty good guy Jeroboam that the prophet said would lead ten tribes in exile in Egypt, and Rehoboam, the son, rightful heir to the throne, not a very good guy, who Solomon appoints as new king. Well, Rehoboam goes to Shechem, and he's going to be crowned king, and he calls Jeroboam home from Egypt for the coronation. Jeroboam comes home, good guy at this point, and he had a couple of the tribes of Israel following him, and he says to Rehoboam, he says, your father Solomon put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and heavy yoke, and we will serve you. Solomon had, in order to preserve the wealth of the nation, had incredibly taxed the people and put them in heavy labor, just like the Pharaoh did to the people of Egypt. Now Solomon had done that to his people, heavy labor and harsh taxes. So Rehoboam, the king's son's well, son, says, well, give me three days to think about this. So Rehoboam, Solomon's son, goes to the elders of the tribes, and he says, what do you think I ought to do? And the elders of the tribe tell him, if you will be a servant of these people, then give them a favorable answer. Yes, I'll reduce taxes and I will make you work less. And the elders say, then they'll serve, serve you forever. They said, to be a true king, to be a true leader in your family and whatever it is, you need to be a servant leader, is what the elders of the tribe told Jeroboam. They need to do what Jesus said. He said, I come to serve, not to be served. So that's what the wise elders told Rehoboam. But Rehoboam instead didn't listen to their advice. He went to the guys he went to high school with, the guys he used to play football with and sneak out of the house and go carousing around town. And the young guys told Rehoboam, they said, well, you tell those people my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid a heavy yoke on them. I'll make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So, what a great insult that is. <laughs> my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. I have more guts than he does. Rehoboam, instead of listening to the wisdom of the elders about servant leadership, instead listened to his peers who weren't old enough to recognize the importance of a united kingdom, and all of a sudden the kingdom of Israel was split in north and two, with the northern kingdom under King Jeroboam and the southern kingdom under King Rehoboam. The northern kingdom had 12 of the 10 of the 12 tribes and was called Israel. The southern kingdom had two of the tribes and was called Judah, the tribe of Benjamin and Judah. Now, Jeroboam was the guy who went in flight down to Egypt, comes back and says, we'll serve you, just cut the taxes and make us work less. Rehoboam is in the southern kingdom he has two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and what happens is look at the enemies around them. There are the Moabites, the Edomites, the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Aramites, the Phoenicians, all surrounding them, all of their enemies surrounding them. And what happens because of the careless indifference of Rehoboam and his young peers and their refusal to listen 
to the wisdom of the elders is that the kingdom is divided in two, with the northern and the southern kingdoms. And in 1 Kings we read, So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. When all the Israelites had heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called the assembly and made Jeroboam, the initial guy, king over all Israel. Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the house of David, and that is in the southern kingdom. So the, 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 the house of David. The house of David and the lineage of Israel was divided among itself. What's tragic is that the division of the house of Israel, the people of Israel, did not come from outside, from their enemies, but instead it came from within. The Hebrew nation, which would be called Israel to the north and Judah to the south, a kingdom once united and strong was divided. Not a divided kingdom never to be united again. What's important for us to remember from this story of the divided kingdom is that unity is a powerful thing, but it's also a very fragile thing. It's interesting is that the devil knows this. The devil or Satan or the adversary, whatever you want to call it, knows the best way to attack a people or a church or a family is not from without, not from the outside, but from within. Because when we yield to the devil's temptation to stop loving, stop caring, stop forgiving, branches and sides are formed and unity is lost. We end the service every Sunday, go in peace and serve the Lord because we're called, each one of us in this church is called to live in peace. And when we fail to protect and preserve the unity of our churches or our families, when we stop caring for one another, when we stop focusing on our unity, we lose our effectiveness both as a church and as a family. So the lesson we learn from Solomon's split under Solomon and his loyalty to worshiping idols and not having a heart after God because he caused indifference to speak into his heart, which then also caused that indifference to eke into the hearts of those around him. He started following other gods. He became insensitive to the needs of his people, caused them heavy labor and big taxation. Solomon and then his son became inflexible. Rather than listening to the advice of elders, he shut out the wisdom of those who had gone before. He did not respect people and instead worshipped other idols, drawing their hearts away from God. All of that led to idolatry. And when people in a nation, in a church, in a family stop following God, they simply fall apart. They fall apart from the away from the God who wants nothing more than to get you back. All of this story in the Old Testament so far, all of these stories point to the need for a Savior, Jesus Christ, who came and took the punishment on himself for our sin, our unfaithfulness, our division, our separation, and Jesus made it possible for us to live in union with God. Kind of like the <coughs> vine and the branches that Jesus talks about in the gospel. I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and you will bear fruit. So we're still early into the year of 2015. From Solomon, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, we learn to seek wise counsel from others and especially seek wise counsel from God. Love those around you with the heart of a servant and seek God's kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all of these things, all of these other things will be given to you as well. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God, we pray that you would